Welcome to $100 Plus Mileage, the podcast about those New Hampshire bills that don't necessarily make the news but could still impact you. There are roughly 1,000 bills in the New Hampshire legislature each year, and that is a lot of legislation. But every bill still gets a public hearing and a vote in the full House or Senate. Every one of those hearings and votes is an opportunity for you to get involved in democracy and make your voice heard. Our job is to give you the unbiased facts, break down the pros and cons, and encourage you to speak up. I'm Mike Dunbar, content editor for Citizens Count. And I'm Anna Brown, director of research and analysis for Citizens Count. All right, Anna, when you first suggested this topic, it sounded a bit wonky. It was something about property taxes and hunting. Didn't sound like the most click-worthy topic for our listeners. Okay, I never expected to find a bill that ties together exotic animals, property taxes, and very indirectly, police misconduct. But here we are. We're going on a journey. (laughs) All right. Without further ado, tell us what we're talking about today. What's the bill? Okay. The bill number is HB 467. The gist of the bill is that it would increase property taxes for private hunting preserves that keep non-native species. To understand what the bill really does, though, first we need to talk about current use and the state's current use property tax breaks. Can you give us a rundown? Sure. So New Hampshire's current use program allows undeveloped land over 10 acres to be taxed at a lower property rate. Uh, There can't be any houses, septic tanks, or other construction on the 10 acres, but it has, but timberland and farmland could qualify. So landowners get an extra discount if they allow public recreation on their land. Okay. So basically current use, it's just keep it wild. And then (laughs) if on top of that, you let people do their hiking and biking or whatever, you get even more discounted. Uh, It's interesting because it doesn't make a lot of headlines. I don't hear a lot about current use in, in those top stories, but over half of New Hampshire's land is actually in current use. Hmm. Yeah, and the program definitely helps protect uh, New Hampshire wilds, like you're saying, you know, whether it's uh, the mountain views or the wetlands. So there's uh, there's definitely a benefit to it. Yeah, that's the, the classic rural character of New Hampshire, from mm-hmm. the White Mountains to the coast or wherever. But not everybody loves it. I have heard some people argue that it creates an unfair property tax burden for low-income homeowners. Because if you, if you think about it, so if you were a wealthy person and have you have an estate with massive lands and mountain views and whatever else, you can get a current use tax break, but then the property owners who have their little plots of land, they have to make up for that potentially. So some, like I said, many, many, many people love current use because it protects our environment. But yeah, so some people are like, uh, we're giving people a lot of tax breaks. What do we get back? Right, right. Yeah. Like, like all tax policies, there are definitely some trade-offs there. Mm, trade-offs, pros and cons, what we do all day. (laughs) Okay, so we've talked a little bit about current use and what that means. Let's get back to HB 467. This bill would exclude property from those current use tax breaks if the land is used, and I quote, to harbor non-native, non-domesticated animal species. Right, okay. And so my immediate question is, is somebody breeding tigers in New Hampshire or something? And do we have like a tiger King situation on our hands? Like what's, what do they mean by that? Yeah, let's be real. That's as soon as I read this bill a couple of weeks ago, I immediately the same thing leapt to mind. And this is not, not a tiger King situation for sadly or not sadly, depending on how you look at it, but it's still kind of interesting and weird. There is this famous secretive private hunting preserve with some exotic animals. And this bill is targeted very specifically at it. The preserve is known as Corbin Park, and it's in the area of Croydon, New Hampshire. Yeah. Okay. So apologies to the good people of Croydon, New Hampshire, but I've definitely never heard of that. So I'm going to need a a few more details on that. (laughs) Yes. I, I hadn't heard of it either until I started researching this bill. So brief shout out to NHPR because there's a great outside in episode about the park. That covers a lot of the history and background. And if you're curious, like you could spend a long day on a deep dive on all the weird things that, well, interesting history. You know, it's a piece of history that have happened at the park. But I'm just going to give a brief overview to kind of talk about why this relates to the bill. So depending on which report you read, the park is anywhere from 19,000 to 26,000 acres. 
And that makes it one of the largest private hunting preserves in the United States. Hmm. Banking millionaire Austin Corbin created the park in the late 1800s, and he stocked the preserve with exotic species from Himalayan mountain goats <laughs> to bison. N- nothing about tigers, um, but the, you know, still non-native okay. species that are technically e- exotic. So mm-hmm. membership for the club is very exclusive. So it's somewhere from 20 to 30 people and a membership fee of five or six figures. Wow. And once again, yeah, super private and exclusive. So we don't know all of the, all of the who is who and, and what is what, but there are definitely some famous guests over the years. Teddy Roosevelt visited the park, for example, and he's known to have shot a boar and displayed the mounted head in his home. And he's not the only president. Uh, I can't remember the ones off the top of my head. But then also Rudyard Kipping, Kip, Kipling, Kipping, gosh, Rudyard Kipling allegedly, allegedly was a visit because there's a reference in Captain Courageous that is most likely about Corbin, the millionaire. And so a character in the book t- uh, talks about it and excuse my accent, this is literally how it's written. It's written like kind of phonetically. So the character talks about a millionaire who owns about every railroad on Long Island, they say, and they say he bought about half New Hampshire and run a lime fence around her and fill her up <laughs> with lions and tigers and bears and buffalo and crocodiles and such all. Okay, first of all, I don't know what kind of accent that's supposed to be. But second of uh, all, I can't believe I'm just hearing about this place now. <laughs> we'd have to go ask Rudyard Kipling because, like I said, there's a lot of basically phonetic spelling there. So I, I can only ass- either that maybe that's what people in New Hampshire sounded like. Back well, then. that's the thing that reminds me of like Fritz Weatherby's thing about like the old New Hampshire accent. Like, you know, I could see that as New Hampshire, you know, <laughs> New Hampshire. OK, that just. That kind of just sounded Midwestern. I'm doing my mom's <laughs> Midwestern accent now. So. Just so, a yeah. whole other sidebar. <laughs> if you want to waste some time on the internet, it's definitely a fun little rabbit hole. No pun intended. And once again, again, to be clear, no lions, tigers, or crocodiles in the park that I'm aware of anyway. But there were bison and actually a big enough herd that um, there's, there's some historical accounts that he helped repopulate bison in the U.S. Okay, so I'm still getting some like Jurassic Park meets Jumanji vibes from this whole story. Oh, oh, oh totally. <laughs> uh, one of the biggest animals they keep there are elk, actually, which can be over 700 pounds. And fun fact, I learned the sound elks make is called bugling. Hmm, that sounds majestic. And I will just say, if anyone out there is looking to distract their coworker right now with an impromptu Teams message or something like that, I definitely encourage you to check out elk bugling. All right, we have a recording of this. Here we go. This is some elk bugling. It is like a cross between a banshee and a toddler crying. It's it's somehow both deeply haunting and strangely underwhelming. Honestly, it kind of reminded me of like whale noises or or frankly, even dinosaur noises like Jurassic Park mm. style. And for sure, if I heard that coming out of the park, I, I would wonder what the heck was <laughs> behind the fence. Definitely. Um, but elk, we're talking about elk. They're not the problematic animal. It's actually Eurasian boar. Because huh. these are wild pigs that have been known to escape the fences. Yeah, and I'm vaguely aware of problems with boars being an invasive species in the South, right? Yes, they can cause a lot of problems because they can damage habitats and crops with, I, I think it's called like wallowing. They'll basically just like break things. <laughs> Learning a lot <laughs> and of new words. They're just, they're just, you know, it's like, I, what is a bull in, in a China cabinet? Maybe that's what they're mm. like in the wild. But at any rate, damage to habitats and crops. And they also outcompete native species for food. So think of, you know, if, if they're eating something, that means something else can't. And they're also speedy and abundant breeders. So <laughs> if it makes it a lot harder to control their population when they have tons of babies. Um, Right now, the owners of Corbin Park do let the locals hunt and kill any wild pigs found outside the preserve, which hopefully is helping to control the population. All right. We got to tie all this back into HB 467 somehow. And I'm not totally convinced you can do it, but I, at the same time, I (laughs) bet you can. In sum, HB 467 would end the current use property tax break for Corbin Park specifically because they keep non-native, non-domesticated species. So let's dive into the pros and cons on that, Anna. Absolutely. The supporters of HB 467 argue that the state's current use law was not intended to protect private landowners raising exotic animals for sport. 
So basically they argue Corbin Park is damaging the environment by introducing native or non-native invasive species. So they shouldn't get a property tax break. Yeah. And in another interesting twist, the guests at Corbin Park don't have to get a hunting license to shoot the wild pigs and elk owned by the park. Without a hunting license, they actually aren't contributing directly to fish and game either, which is responsible for managing New Hampshire's wildlife, including invasive species, should they escape the park. So, like, basically, if we boil down the pro argument to its really, its core, it's that these wealthy hunters aren't paying their fair share. Right. Now, on the other hand, these hunters probably do generate some tourist income for the area when they come and spend their money at hotels and restaurants. So there is that to consider. Yeah. And there's also problems if we start playing with New Hampshire's current use law. So at the bill hearing, I heard several people testify that if this becomes law, other private hunting preserves would probably have to close shop and sell their land to private developers, which, you know, that's when we're losing out on that wild space because there's a Walmart now or something. So from what I understand, some of these preserves raise pheasants and other non-native game birds, especially for training hunting dogs. Ah, yes, the doctrine of unintended consequences. And I still can't believe this is a thing in New Hampshire, but... Like we said, each of those hunting preserves has more undeveloped land, they attract tourists, they support hunting, etc. So, you know, there is that to consider. Yeah, I mean, hunting is a long-standing important part of wildlife management. And I've read some reports that it's on the decline, which, you know, there's a lot of things on the decline these days. So, you know, in a, in a way, it's if we start messing with current use, we could be messing with you know, hunting and things that support our environment. And let's also remember Corbin Park has some problems with wild boar, but it's still a huge area for native New Hampshire wildlife as well. Hmm. So the last twist here is where the money actually goes. So property taxes go to towns and the state for school funding. That means changing the current use law wouldn't directly give the fish and game department funds to manage these invasive species. So I was going to say that wraps it up, but didn't you start this episode with a teaser about police misconduct? I did. I did. Okay. And to be clear, this is a purely coincidental connection, but given everything in the news these days about police misconduct, I, when I saw this, I just had to throw it into the mix. <laughs> so yeah, little rabbit hole again, down Corbin Park's history. So in 2004, a man named Stephen Laro shot and killed Robert Pruell during a hunting trip on the property of Corbin Park. So some lawmakers have brought this up in the past as an example of how the state, you know, still has to get involved with Corbin Park land sometime because obviously, you know, the state had to go out and, and investigate the scene and emergency services and whatever else. So hmm. ultimately, Lero was found not guilty of negligent homicide, even though I, I read some reports that like the state brought in a giant stuffed like taxidermy boar to to be like this does not look like a human but anyway <laughs> so yeah i mean like i said it, you, you can spend a lot of time on the internet with this mm. but the fish and game department did move to revoke Har laro's hunting license which is also a whole separate process that we could probably do another episode on about who gets hunting licenses because there's some bills about that um anyway here comes the odd coincidence this is not the first time Laro was in the news. In the 1990s, he was the main witness in the murder case against Carl Lorry. That name may ring some bells because hmm. Lorry appealed his murder conviction to the New Hampshire Supreme Court, and he said the prosecution failed to disclose Laro's employment records as a detective sergeant with the Franklin Police, which could have impacted his case because according to news reports, and I'm quoting here from a Foster's Daily Democrat article, the records on Laro included, quote unquote, reports of Laro being volatile, volatile, neglecting his duty and threatening civilians. So the state Supreme Court sided with Lori, and this resulted in the creation of the so-called Lori list of cops with credibility oh. issues that could impact <laughs> criminal conditions. Yeah, it all comes back around. Yeah. So in the past couple of years, there's been a lot of debate about what information on that list should be public. And there's actually an ongoing lawsuit. I think they're working on a settlement, but it's several newspapers in the ACLU are suing the state to make that information public. And that, Mike Dunbar, is how I found a bill that ties together property taxes, invasive pigs, and police misconduct. Wow. You have outdone yourself once again, Anna Brown. <laughs> so what happens next with this bill? The House Municipal Ken County Government Committee voted 17 to 2 to recommend the full House kill this bill, HB 467. 
And without changing the wording, a lot of legislators on the committee were concerned the bill would have broad unintentional effects on those other hunting preserves or maybe even some farms, which there was some debate about, you know, what exactly would be a non-native, non-domesticated animal since it wasn't really defined. So anyway, the full house has its next voting days in April. And if you have an opinion on HB 467 or any other bill that they're going to be voting on, you should contact your state representative and share your opinion. All right. It's that time in our episode only in New Hampshire. And I think it's your turn. What do you have for us today? Okay, so there's an obvious tie in here, but it also comes from one of our most popular articles we've ever written on our website. For whatever (laughs) reason, people are constantly searching for this topic on Google and they come to our website because Google has decided our article like ranks, whatever. So the topic is what exotic pets can you own without a permit in the Granite State? It will never cease to amaze me that that is such a popular article on our website. Amazingly popular. So on that list, we have, among other things like cats and dogs and gerbils, camels, zebras, Mm. tenrex, if I'm saying that right, it it kind of looks like a hedgehog, reindeer, if you want to open up your own Santa's workshop, and quote unquote, Mm. feral pigeons, which I... I mean, I guess, is that the type of pigeon you feed in the park? (laughs) I don't, I don't know. Anyway, and and many more. But you do need a permit from the state fish and game department to keep controlled species. And that list covers everything from elephants to lions to woodchucks and buzzards. Like the degree to which that list Mm. is specific really makes me wonder, like, do they have people coming to him that are very specifically like, hello, this is my buzzard, Charles. I know he doesn't have feathers (laughs) on his heads, but he likes to cuddle me. Can I keep him? Like, I I don't, I don't really understand. (laughs) Or can I keep this woodchuck that was in my front yard? Like some of them (laughs) seem so exotic and some of them just seem like you found an animal like walking around. The, and we're like, you're mine. <laughs> yeah, it's like non-exotic. Like, and I just yes. think too, especially the woodchuck is a little funny because I feel I have known several people who grow vegetables who have very personal vendettas against the woodchucks mm. oh, in their yeah. yard. So I wonder if at one point one guy was like, you know what? Instead of fighting you, I'm just going to join you. Let's be friends, Woodchuck. And then <laughs> if you're so like hungry, that. I'm just going to take you inside and let you have dinner with me. You know, <laughs> you don't have to eat the vegetables out here. All right. So if you're curious on some more animals on that list, just go to our site and search exotic pet. The article comes up in the results right away and uh, you can see the links in there to what you do and don't need permission to have join at your dinner table as a pet. It has been a journey, Anna. And that about wraps it up for our episode today. You can find more information and episodes at citizenscount.org. We'd like to thank Franklin Pierce University for producing and the Grand State News Collaborative for hosting. Our theme music is composed by me, Mike Dunbar. Lastly, we thank you for giving us a listen and thinking about how you can be a part of what makes New Hampshire by the people, for the people.